Welcome to the Afghan Eye YouTube channel. If this is your first visit, make sure to subscribe and press the notification bell so that you won't miss any of our new videos. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to another Afghan Eye Live. I'm your host, Sangar Paikar. And I'm Ahmed Walid Kakar. So, welcome everyone. Uh, in this live stream, we're going to try to address a few very controversial questions uh certain matters that have uh, been flaring up recently um especially in the online community you guys have certainly seen uh tirades of uh people uh basically talking about ethnicity and nationality and accusing one or the other group or ethnic group of all sorts of crimes and to what extent is that true or false and where these ideas about ethnicity national identity and ethno nationalism come from uh, we will try to address all of that in a concise manner and we will try to do that in a responsible manner um, in the way that we see fit as uh, the afghan eye uh, so, uh, you know, when you open a book or when you study any subject matter, you always have to deal with the fact that the author has a per certain perspective on matters. And so do we as a platform, we have our perspective. So uh, even when addressing these matters, you have to bear in mind that this is the perspective of Ahmad Walid Kakar and Sangar Paikar. So you're free to go and study and investigate matters for yourself. But what we are going to do is give our commentary and our perspective on these issues uh, for whatever that's worth to you, our audience. OK, so uh, that before... was the most politically correct introduction I have ever heard. But yeah, I, I agree. Uh, yeah. I think that was really well done. And I think um, I think, uh, you know, it needed that sort of thing needed uh, to be said. So, um, yeah, it has been, I'm sure everyone, those of us who are on social media, of course, uh, have seen a uh, the online discussion descending into, um, you know, the abyss almost. And the problem with that, of course, is that um, the collapse of the Republic that we saw in uh, August 2021, uh, that republic had a lid on a load of problems and diseases uh, that had been suppressed for a very long time. And when that lid came off, the stench that was caused or that was being suppressed is now out in the open and it will be out in the open uh, for the foreseeable future. So it's on that basis that we've been requested to uh, do this uh, podcast slash live stream whatever we want to call it. And uh, yeah, like Sangar said, these these are our perspectives. Uh, just as people have their perspectives, we have ours. We've decided to get together and do this podcast. So Sangar, let's get started. So first, so the topic of today, of course, is ethno-nationalism, uh, national identity uh, pertaining to Afghanistan. Uh, and so on and so forth. So if we speak about nationalism versus ethno-nationalism, they are more or less the same thing, a sense of imagined community. Uh, nationalism doesn't necessarily have to be ethnic. It can be based on different um, sort of uh, things or realities or commonalities, but ethno-nationalism is based specifically on the realm of ethnicity and it ticks the nationalism box. So Sangar, Tell us about, you know, from almost walk us through from a, let's say, a philosophical perspective. We know that nationalism really starts after the, well, the nation state starts after the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648. It's a process that coincides with the Western Enlightenment. So there's obviously a philosophical underpinning and basis here. Why don't you walk us through that? Thank you. So, yes, uh, the world... Uh, prior to modernity and Western enlightenment, uh, 
uh, ideas of Western Enlightenment, all of this. Before that, the world was very different. Uh, people's identities were based on their values, the region where they were from, their tribe and their customs. And most of the matters uh, weren't always politicized. And nationalism as an idea is a product of modernity. Uh, it is a concept that has emerged after the Enlightenment. Just as you said, uh, the Treaty of Westphalia ended a 30-year-long war in Europe where approximately 8 million people died. And uh, after uh, the Treaty of Westphalia was signed by warring parties in that conflict, uh, there, uh, there was this treaty that created uh, international political boundaries uh, between different sides. And uh, these international political boundaries were a novel idea and, and concept that didn't exist before that. Uh, so as a consequence of that, we also have now this notion of a nation state. Uh, it is very difficult for a lot of people to understand but these nation states as such with their political boundaries, they didn't exist in the past. Uh, and with the creation of the nation state, uh, the subjects of the state started to identify with the state. So suppose you uh, lived in an area that was dominated by the French state, you were supposed to identify with the French state. And not identifying with that state would be seen as a threat. Exactly. And this is something that was actually uh, new. Uh, people didn't have to identify with the state uh, in the past. Uh, around the same period in Europe, there were other developments. Uh, there was the 18th century Enlightenment movement, the Rational School, uh, most notably by authors such as Voltaire or the empiricist David Hume. And according to this Rational School of Thought, um, Reason, causality, uh, empirical observation uh, was the way to understand the world. Uh, and on the opposite side was the Romanticist school of thought. And uh, the high priest of the Romanticist school of thought was uh, uh, the Swiss-French uh, philosopher uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. And Jean-Jacques Rousseau has famously written in one of his books, the first line was, Man is born free but everywhere he's in chains. Hi, hi. Hi, Mashallah, subhanallah. <laughs> so, I mean, to be, to be honest, it is, it is a profound kind of, uh, it's, it's a good one. We'll all, that's I'll how he that. started one of his books. And Jean-Jacques yeah. Rousseau, basically, his most uh, noteworthy political work is called uh, uh, The Social Contract. And... Yeah. Uh, Rousseau had this idea that uh, the human being is a noble savage and uh, a man's carnal instincts are very noble and pure, uh, while externally imposed morality and rules are all oppressive. And you Plato, see a lot of... Yeah. Plato would take massive issue with that, but yeah. And, and you see that in the modern society as well, yeah, like... like uh, uh, people uh, have a tendency to glorify this idea that people's carnal urges are very noble and S celebrate as a self-discovery and exactly and the romantic philosophers uh, for them uh, beauty of nature poetry music and art was very important it was a central aspect of their uh, beliefs and thoughts and how they expressed those thoughts and uh, from a you know romanticist perspective, man is an emotional, an artistic, and passionate being. Instead of reason, uh, imagination, and feelings are better ways to understand the world. So that's why around the same time you had a lot of um, uh, novels and books, paintings, uh, music uh, was composed, uh, uh, which all can be categorized as the influences of the romanticist movement. And uh, Rom uh, romantic poet uh, uh, George Gordon Byron was also a very influential poet. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, even uh, Khan Abdul Ghaffar Khan uh, of the Awami National Party, you know, the, the, the ideological founder of the Pashtun nationalism in Peshawar yeah. and area, uh, 
Um, he uh, yeah, is known to be someone who has read Byron. And Afrasiab Khatak, who is currently a very prominent uh, political figure in Pakistan, who is a Pashtun nationalist, he sometimes quotes Byron in his articles, etc. So you see, the, 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 the romanticist idea in political philosophy uh, is also a subject that a lot of people uh, are not quite really aware of. But uh, before the uh, French Enlightenment, uh, before the Enlightenment in Europe, culture and identity was not homogenous. So mm -hmm. uh, the French, the Germans, the Dutch, the English, they were not homogenous groups. Like even the mm -hmm. French language was homogenized. Its spelling and grammar was homogenized by the state after the French Revolution and after the Enlightenment. Before that, in France, there were different regions where people spoke yeah. different languages and they couldn't yeah. understand each other. And the standardization of language and grammar, this is something that was new in Europe. Uh, it was happened after the Enlightenment. The only other known uh, standardization of language that a lot of people knew of before that was Arabic because Quran was a book written in Arabic uh, and, and, and uh, used all across the world. And that particular Arabic of the Quran became a standard for a language that could Hazrat be understood. Hazrat Osman did that, I believe. Yeah, and, and, and Arabic could be understood. The Quranic Arabic could, could be understood from Morocco all the way in the West to Indonesia all the way in the East. And this is... So that this was a unique uh, uh, case. It, it wasn't the case with other languages uh, back then. Mm -hmm. But in any case, uh, so um, once France became a nation state and after the French Revolution, mm -hmm. the French, they developed their own national identity, their national anthem, you know, uh, Le Marseillais. Uh, it's a poem that appeals to emotion glorification mm -hmm. of the French as a noble and superior beings. And other uh, European nation states developed similar concepts of national identity during the same period, during the colonial era. All these literature from the uh, Enlightenment from Europe, they were imported in the colonized countries such as in, like in Africa, Asia, um, uh, Southeast Asia. So uh, even like in countries such as Afghanistan, Pakistan, Iran, uh, a lot of books from the French uh, Enlightenment and uh, generally uh, literature of the, the Romanticist school were uh, to thought in schools. Like uh, mm -hmm. during the British occupation of uh, British India, uh, the children of the elite, they used to go in special schools and in those special schools, uh, a lot of these books would, were being thought. Uh, so this is how these ideas found, uh, uh, like they were spread in colonized uh, countries. So the romanticist trend shaped the idea of nationality, the nation state, um, and its own mythology and stories of its origin. So every nation state has its own myths, like, uh, like uh, the Nazi Germany, uh, the Nazis, they had this myth that they are from a superior race. They are the Aryans and they originally uh, come from somewhere in Ariana. And they, 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 they are very uh, like ubermensch they say ubermensch yeah. in german like superior human beings and these ideas they were also spread in colonized parts of the world so that's why you see the arab nationalism like the first arab nationalists they also had similar ideas as the nazis and 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 the glorification of their uh, culture their language their mythology and their origins is all essentially part of this romanticist philosophy, this romanticist perspective on uh, the world, the human nature and everything. So basically, if, if we're talking about ethno-nationalism or nationalism as a whole, as modern phenomena, we have to bear in mind that we're talking about this particular uh, philosophical so, so, I mean, ultimately, ultimately, I guess you could say, because it has such strong roots in romanticist sort of schools of philosophy, you could say that the entire enterprise, to a large extent, is motivated by uh, base and carnal 
uh, instincts, you know, the desire for community, familiarity, uh, and so on and so forth. These are, you know, that the glorification of carnal base instincts, as you, uh, as you pointed out, that's something that uh, goes on in the current day. Um, that obviously translates into nationalism as well. Yes, and uh, okay, so now that we have laid a uh, foundation, uh, as, your, as our in-house historian, maybe you can tell us now about uh, how the concept of nationalism and national identity was introduced in Afghanistan. Okay, sure. So um, I would say the first thing that comes to mind when we start talking about Afghan national identity, right, is a man called Mahmoud Tarzi. Okay, now who was Mahmoud Tarzi? Mah Mahmoud Tarzi was a Mohammedze Pashtun uh, related to the royal family who returned to Afghanistan uh, after uh, the death of Amir Abdurrahman Khan. So during the reign of Amir Abdurrahman Khan, notable families had been exiled, uh, predominantly Mohammed Zay families. Uh, some had been exiled. So for example, Zahir Shah's family had been exiled to India. Tarzi's family went to the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire at the time, as we know it in the, in the mid to late 19th century, came under profound influence from Europe, as well as, like you said, the Romanticist uh, sort of school of philosophy, ideas of nationalism, and so on and so forth. So Mahmoud Tarzi spent a lot of his time in Turkey, in Turkey, in the Ottoman Empire, and was deeply influenced by the things that he was seeing in the world. So ideologically, we can say that Mahmoud Tarzi's compass was pointed towards pan-Islamism, Islamic modernism, nationalism. Now, a lot of people may think, whoa, how, how does nationalism and pan-Islamism and so on and so forth come together? You see, Mahmoud Tarzi, uh, whilst in Af I would say in Afghanistan, he's been misunderstood. So I remember I was in a Twitter space once, Sangar, and I was like, the sanctification of Islam as point of Afghan national identity comes from Tarzi, and I'll get into that in a bit. And this guy in the space was like, what the hell are you talking about? Tarzi was a very progressive individual. So the point is, is that he's been misunderstood. On the one hand, the religious in Afghanistan have so come to understand him as some, as some sort of godless secular heathen, and the seculars have come to understand him as some sort of progressive champion, whereas he doesn't really align with any of those two things. Islamic modernism was, and pan-Islamism went hand in hand. The idea was that the Muslim world was composed of different blocks, those blocks needed to come closer together to fight off against European colonialism. So in that sense, he belonged very much to the intellectuals and the thinkers of his day who very much thought the same thing. They weren't necessarily classically trained in the religious sciences. Sometimes they may have said things or believed things that may have conflicted with more sort of conservative parts of the religious establishment, but that was what they believed. And they believed in appropriating you know, European ideas of nationalism to kickstart progress, to kickstart modernization, European, you know, education. So Tarzi was this kind of person. He's often called a feminist as well. He was very big, and this is obviously pertinent as well, because female education is still a problem, or problem, it's a problematic issue in Afghanistan. Tarzi was a very strong proponent of female education, but here's the point. The reason was not because he wanted to liberate women and you know make them take off their clothes but his view was that the mother's role in the woman's role in society is that of a mother and an educated mother will raise educated children and thus society will progress and so on and so his idea of the role of a woman was one that was very patriarchal he just wanted to upgrade it and upgrade the patriarchy as well so Tarzi. This is this is by the way uh, a, a still a very prevalent uh, idea even ab amongst very very conservative Christians here in Europe. Like mm -hmm. even here in the Netherlands, we have this ultra conservative uh, Christian uh, denomination where until very recently women were not allowed to vote and participate in elections. Like in, even less than the, ten years ago, the party changed its stance uh, regarding women, but. They have the same argument, or uh, like uh, Tarzi about women's education. It's 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 just to 
They, they don't want women in politics, but they do want women to get education. Exactly. But I mean, I mean, I would disagree very respectfully with Tarzi that an educated mother will raise educated children and everything will be good. Because let me tell you, Sangar, I have seen the children of uneducated mothers be very intelligent. And I have seen the children of educated mothers be an absolute nightmare to talk to. But the point that I'm making here is that Tarzi is not, you know, a French feminist, free the nipple kind of guy. In fact, he actually mocked them quite a lot. But his role, his his emphasis on the role of education for women specifically was to upgrade society within an overarching patriarchal structure. So Tarzi tried to compel Olama back then as well to accept modern education. He tried to push for Afghan independence. So at the time, Afghanistan's foreign affairs were controlled by the British Empire. And he tried to create a national identity in a country with many different ident with uh, different ethnicities. So that idea or that identity was what we call Afghaniyat, okay? What it means to be an Afghan. Now, I believe Afghaniyat as a, as a term was actually used by Khushal Khan Khatak, but under Tarzi, it started to embody something more. So Tarzi built it on a couple of branches, right? It was Watan, motherland, fatherland, Din, religion and the religion was defined by the way so tarzi once again is not some sort of secularist he was uh, he defined religion as being the sunni school of hanafi sorry the hanafi school of sunni fiqh and that tied in with what he called dawlat dosti okay being friendly to the government right because the amir was like the soul of the country and the Amir of you even now the the role the word Amir is different to Shah the Amir is a specifically religious term the the ruler the Amir derives his legitimacy from religion quite literally so you see how what sorry you see how Deen religion and Dawlat Dosti tie in together right big one reinforces the other uh, and the other branch was Milat so nation so I believe, so Tarzi said something along the lines of, if the fatherland were to be compared to a being, the nation would form the bones and the, fle uh, the bones and flesh and the king would be its soul. So this is one unit coming together. And uh, there's also a hadith, I don't know if it's authentic or not, but it's frequently used by Afghan nationalists. Hubb al-watan min al-iman. Right, the love that's of the actually country. that's not a hadith that's a poetic expression in the arabic uh, uh, literature so okay Arabs so say that but but so, yeah so so you see so the love of the uh the, the love of the homeland is from amongst the branches uh, of faith and once again that comes back to and the reason i'm talking about education and modernization here is because this comes back to his whole overarching structure of national identity loving your country means defending it which means that we need modernization which means we need education which means we need unity which needs us to support the monarchy so what tarzi tried to do was formulate a national identity based on the characteristics of the country's inhabitants now, obviously, you and I know back then, as, of, as now as well, that the country's inhabitants came from diverse backgrounds. They diverse religious backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, linguistic backgrounds, tribal backgrounds. So obviously, when you're trying to create a national identity, you appeal to what is common, which is what I've discussed here. Religion, first and foremost, the love of the country, the king, and so on and so forth. But of course, it also depends just, very... Just before, before okay. you move on, what you just described is also essential for people to understand that while Tarzi was very conservative for our modern understanding, he was, moder he was a modernist in the sense that he believed that he could shape identity and shape society with thoughts and ideas. And that, that's a novel concept that people mm -hmm. think they can create this whole idea of who people are and what they should be exactly so so we, so coming back to tarzi so tarzi i told you was a muhammad zay pashtun and this is important because he's related to the royal family not just because of his tribal background but also because his daughter married king amanullah who was unveiled 
Amon Allah unveiled his wife, and you know how the story goes. We've discussed that part as well. But the point is, is that Tarzi's position as a privileged member of the extended royal family and the father of the queen means that his appetite for reform would obviously be limited it would be moderate right he's not he doesn't want to overall throw the whole structure away rather he wants to fine-tune it so Tarzi trying to create this and you could say a lot of the problems started with Tarzi and this isn't well, someone's going to come and call me a national traitor for criticizing Tarzi this isn't what I'm saying here but I'm saying that inevitably when you're trying to create a national identity you're going to come across problems right and in a country like Afghanistan there'll definitely be problems so when you're trying to create a national identity especially in Afghanistan it's obviously very natural that that national identity will be very heavily infused by the Pashtun ethnic group and the Pashto language. So Tarzi criticized local tribal affiliations and continuously emphasized the Watan within the boundaries of the kingdom. But now here's where it, where it gets controversial. Tarzi wanted Pashto to be promoted as the lingua franca or the national language, right? Now at this time, at this time, uh, Dari or Farsi, whatever you want to call it, was used as the court language, it was the official language, and so on and so forth. Now, the problem is not so much for Tarzi and like-minded individuals with the language of Farsi. The, the way that Tarzi and his contemporaries and those who think like him, the way they would have seen this is that Farsi is a language, yes, and it's a language, by the way, he wrote a lot in primarily in Farsi. So he wasn't trying to obliterate the language of the face of the earth. But the way he would have seen it was that Farsi is the language of all, and it's not unique. So the Ottomans used Farsi for a very long time. The Safawis used Farsi. The In Iran, the Qajars used Farsi. The Seljuks used Farsi. The Mughals used Farsi. The Uzbeks used Farsi. And if you're going to try creating a national identity, it needs to be something unique, right? Coming back to the Romanticist, part of the discussion of ours if you want a national identity there's no point sharing its accessories with practically everyone in the world there needs to be something that's unique about it and farsi for that purpose was a was as an official language and as language of the land was good but in order to be unique it was not good enough because it was the language of all of all ethnicities of many different nations um now this is like i said where it gets you know, this is uh, this is essentially Tarzi's nationalism. This is where it starts to get more controversial. So Pashto was actually promoted by Amir Sher Ali, uh, but at the time it primarily stuck to sort of government institutions. So Sher Ali set up military academies which recruited Ghilji and it recruited Wirdak very extensively and they obviously were not from the higher echelons of society that spoke persian as their lingua franca they needed pashto which is why the military ranks in afghanistan you know breed general dagarwal so on and so forth these things kind of come from shir ali's period as well this is where like, and this isn't you know we're understanding tarzi as an intellectual as someone who lived within his time whose perspectives would have been shaped by the circumstances in which he found himself, this isn't to say he was evil or he was the greatest thing in the world, but rather this is, let's say, the, the dawn of Afghan nationalism, very based on Islam, very much reformist, very much monarchist, seeing Pashto as a tool or an accessory to make the country unique amongst a sea of occupied, colonized countries. Okay, so... Uh... This brings us to uh, an important point. Uh, what you're saying uh, was that Tarzi was a nationalist, but mm -hmm. not an ethno-nationalist. No. So why is he viewed controversially by some? Uh, was he? Well, could could we say that he was ethno-nationalist, especially what you just mentioned about Farsi and Pashto, like? I mean, the thing is, is that we have to define what ethno-nationalism is, right? So. Tarzi was not create, uh, advocating for the creation of an ethno state, right? Now, one could say, one could say the Muhammad Zay dynasty, by virtue of it being Pashtun and in charge of the whole country, was spearheading an ethno state, right? 
if that's your definition, fine. But Tarzi was not trying to obliterate uh, the Farsi language. In fact, he insisted on Farsi being enshrined as, I believe it was Zaban Rasmi, the official language. He wrote primarily in Farsi. But he believed very strongly that in order for Afghanistan to be unique, it needed something that the other countries didn't have. The British India, no one spoke Pashto, it wasn't an official language there, nor in Iran, and so on and so forth. But if the question comes that, you know, Tarzi's nationalism was very Pashtun, as in his Afghan nationalism, his nationalism of the country we know as Afghanistan was very infused with, you know, the accessories of Pashtun culture, then yes, that's that's a granted. I, I would concede that point. And I would also say it's not very surprising as well, because the Afghan state as we know it is the rump state of an empire founded by Pashtuns. So okay. it's, it's, it's a grand, it's a given point that that's natural. Okay. So we have to also get a perception of what the state of the country was like, uh, at that particular time, like, uh, Mahmoud Tarzi spent some time abroad. Uh, he traveled through Europe, Middle East, and then he came back to Afghanistan and he found himself in Afghanistan. What was the state of affairs in Afghanistan where he introduced his ideas and views? So when Tarzi returned to Afghanistan, what we had for the first time was an actual modern state or a kingdom, right? However, there was no national identity, right? So... So Tarzi came in after families that had been exiled had been pardoned by Amir Habibullah. Now, Amir Habibullah's father, Abdul Rahman, had created this state, this modern state, to a large extent with British money and British weapons. But there was no underlying sort of romanticist national ideal. There was no, you know, this is what it means to be an Afghan or citizen of this country. In fact, it was a, rather a pre-modern paradigm. Abdul Rahman Khan based his legitimacy on defending this land known as Afghanistan against the Kuffar, against the British and the Russians. And he based his legitimacy on the fact that he was an Amir and he ruled according to the Sharia. Now, this is something that we've spoken about as well before when we've discussed the nation state and the Islamic world. You know, prior to the advent of modernity, the ruler's legitimacy was derived by him uh, ruling in accordance with the Sharia. If he did not, then the ulama would have problems with him, which could result in a rebellion, which could result in him being overthrown. So this is how Abdul Rahman, employing all of the machinery of a modern state, justified his rule. I protect you from the infidels, the Russians and the British, and I rule in accordance with the Sharia. During Abdul Rahman's reign, um, there had been something like 40 rebellions. So Abdul Rahman ruled for about 21, 22 years. 40 rebellions means that there was about two rebellions per year. Uh, I, I don't know off the top i don't remember off the top of my head which ethnicity where did the most rebellions but a very large number of those rebellions were done uh by pashtun tribes uh specifically uh the Ghilji, who did not like being taxed uh who had traditionally maintained roads open for government in a, uh, and being paid they didn't like being taxed this had been a problem for afghan rulers going back about a century and in order uh, one of the reasons he did this, uh, but um, in order to weaken them, he destroyed entire villages and towns in the south and the southeast and forcibly uh, relocated or deported uh, a lot of these Ghilji to the north and to the northwest of the country. So, for example, in Qataran, which is not a term that we know anymore except for the music, but Qataran referring to the northeastern part of Afghanistan, a penal colony was set up specifically for Ghilji. For those that don't know what a penal colony is, it is what the British initially used Australia for to ship all of their criminals to in order to make them do work. So that, that was one of the reasons he'd forcibly uh, relocated Pashtuns uh, to the north. And uh, before... In before before he used uh, Kunduz as a penal colony, uh, Kunduz was a swampland, 
And there yes. is a Farsi uh, that is say, saying, Aga Mark Mikhail Kondusburo, because <laughs> it was so inhospitable yeah. uh, that they say, if you want to die, go to Kondus. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, he it's... basically deported all these people by force into that swampland. So, so we'll get into Abdurrahman exactly how, but he also um, he forcefully converted Kafiristan to Nuristan, right? And after that, he gave himself the label of Zia al Milat wa Din, the light of Zia is light, right? I don't know that Zia. Okay, my Arabic's not the best. Uh, Zia al Milat, but essentially it, Zia the, basically means uh, light, source of light and bright. Source of light for the nation and the religion. Uh, Amir Abdurrahman also. Uh, waged, uh, declared and waged the jihad against uh, Shia Hazara, uh, so in which large numbers of Hazaras had died. So the point is, is that Afghanistan was, in the identity sense, a fractured country, but one in which Abdul Rahman had attempted to cement his authority by emphasizing his rule as a Sunni Islamic king. Okay. Um, okay, so uh this man what you described so far um for people who have studied um the history of europe modern history of europe especially after the advent of modernity uh there are certain similarities with 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 uh, napoleon bonaparte because bonaparte was also a modern leader a military leader who also was quite in love with himself and <laughs> you you can see that uh, also in amir abdurrahman khan that uh, like who calls himself ziaul melati like it's it it, it reveals a a, a um, like an being, infatuation with yeah, yourself yeah and and this is also a mod uh, uh, like like uh, a modern concept that that the leader uh, thinks he can shape the society, shape uh, people's identity. He can reorganize how people live, and also, uh, uh, like, you know, they say um, that uh, Plato has introduced the concept of the philosopher kings, yes. that they should rule the world mm. because uh, uh, they are more entitled. They're made of gold, and the others are made of lesser metals like these myths that uh, were introduced by plato more than 2000 years ago we mm -hmm. see that after the advent of modernity we had many such leaders who really thought that they are above everyone else mm -hmm. uh so a very controversial point uh on this uh this i just uh, i just want to just before you yeah. ask keep this question in mind yeah. uh, abdurrahman also and th i'm just throwing this in just to highlight that things are complex here abdurrahman had terrible relations with his own tribe for many many years with his own Muhammad Zay. but later on in his reign he made them uh, Sharik Daulat yeah so uh, partners of state so he made his own tribe partners of state trying to basically create a warrior military class at the top that would reinforce him if things got, ever got bad but this is actually where he screwed his tribe over the most because prior to this his tribe remained predominantly in Kandahar where they had large estates where they could command the loyalty of thousands of men where they were seasoned warriors uh, but then when he started relocating loads of these tribal heads to Kabul where the settled city life and its luxuries and its pleasures started to uh you know exert their appeal over them what happened is that they lost those independent bases of support so their survival and their prosperity became tied to the state which is why if you look almost entirely the kabul branch let's say of the muhammad zay no longer exist they exist in kandar by the way of course no that's a point because in afghanistan we all think they got entirely kabulized they didn't but the Kabul branch are all almost entirely in the Bay Area or New York or Germany and so on and so forth. But the point I'm making here is that he went and did a complete U-turn, even with regard to his own tribe here. So what I'm trying to say is that this was a king for whom all of these steps were not motivated by ideology or romanticism. 
romantic maybe to himself when he was Ziyal Millat with Din, but these were all moves intended to cement his own power. Okay, so as we see, you know, uh, especially now online, uh, uh, we see a lot of people from Afghanistan who are very extremely toxic uh, and, and full of hatred for other ethnic groups. Like there are people who uh, have openly called for uh, ethnic cleansing of uh, Pashtuns who are settled in the north, as you described. Um, so you explained uh, that uh, uh, Abdurrahman Khan forced the Ghiljai tribe, you know, some of them to settle in Kunduz because it was a penal con colony. Mm. Uh, but could you also say that Qataran. he did in Qataran, yes. So uh, uh, could you also say that this was motivated by his desire to spread Pashtuns everywhere, sort of Pashtun hegem hegemony? Uh, so because the thing is... Yeah, that's that that's 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 a popular uh, idea among certain groups of people they believe that it was a huge conspiracy uh, by him against so non pashtuns is, yeah of course so the thing is is that when amir Ab amir abdurrahman khan let's situate him in the larger context right amir, Ab amir, amir abdurrahman khan was the grandson of dos Muhammad khan son of muhammad afzal khan muhammad afzal khan was appointed by his father Dost Muhammad to be the governor of Turkestan, which means that Abdurrahman was actually born in the area known as Turkestan, which it's no longer known as right now. But in the area, uh, you know, now that we know as Jozjan, Akcha, Shibirgan, these areas were known as Turkestan. Amir Abdurrahman knew Farsi, Pashto, Uzbek. He even knew Uzbek. So he spent the point I'm making is that he spent much of his time in the north. And when he came to take the throne, he came from Samarkand from the north, down Koyistan, down the Safi areas, down the Tajik areas, down Shamali. And he was um, supported by people from that region. When he took Kandahar, when he took Kandahar, he was not welcomed by the local people. They didn't see him as one of their own, even though he was a Durrani Muhammad Zay. He'd actually consented with the British, as I mentioned in my uh, Durand Line article, to actually give Kandahar to the British. But when the British couldn't rule it, they decided to give it back. So once again, this idea that this is a, you know, a, a, a Durrani Muhammad Zay supremacist, like, no, this is this is a king, right? So he'll do what he has to do. Now, as far as moving Pashtuns to different parts of his kingdom, as far as Pashtuns go, this isn't actually anything new. So, you know, the King Shir Shah Suri, he moved Afghans from what is now, you know, Waziristan and sa southern parts of Pashtun Khwa. He moved them into the heart of India so they could serve as his auxiliary, as his forces, as his loyalists there. Uh, so even with regard to Pashtuns, this isn't the first time it's happened. Um, and it wasn't the last either, because subsequent rulers followed the same uh, thing as well. Even, you know, if you think about the Ottoman Empire, if you think about why there are so many Turks, Turkmen, that are now in northern Iraq, right? Many of them were moved by Sultan Murad to serve as a buffer against the Persians. Sultan Murad also moved Arab families from different... So, you know, population encouraging population uh, transfer uh, is very much not something that's unique to Abdurrahman or even indeed to um, Afghanistan. But the pro if we come back to Afghanistan specifically in Abdurrahman's time, prior to Dost Muhammad Khan, Abdurrahman's grandfather, there were roughly 13 uh, Uzbek ruled principalities north of the Hindu Kush and south of the Amu. So that whole area was not sort of a geographically contiguous political unit. It was separated into 13 or so principalities, primarily ruled by Uzbeks who generally tended to fight each other, which made taking them over uh, rather simple. So one of them, for example, I believe was the Mir of uh, Qunduz. His name was Mir Ataliq. And these were generally economically underdeveloped areas. So Mir Ataliq used to launch uh, annual expeditions to Hazarajat to enslave uh, Shia Hazaras and sell them in the markets of Qunduz. Uh, now, I mentioned that Amir Abdurrahman 
when it came to the Pashtuns in the tribal belt south of Kabul, uh, he started to destroy their villages and forcibly transplant them north. There was uh, the penal colony in Qataran as well. Uh, but as well, at the same time, in 1888, I believe, his cousin, Muhammad Ishaq Khan, rebelled against him uh, with the support of locals in the north. Um, and this is a period in which Abdurrahman you know, nearly loses his throne. So afterwards, the reprisals are very brutal. And it's said that this is, you know, the, the height of his cruelty. Um, and there's also, yeah, you have to bear in mind the international context as well. So it, it is said that Abdurrahman's last words to his son were never trust the Russians. So he'd spent 12 years in exile. So in he, was, he was the first Russophobic... Uh... Politician. You could say you could say so, and it, what makes this more interesting is that he'd spent twelve years in Samarkand under the Russians, under Russian protection. So he really feared the Russians as well. Um, now the Russians uh, in 1885, there's an incident called the Panjdeh incident in which Russian troops uh, attack an oasis, which is now in Turkmenistan. Um, and the Afghan forces are beaten back and they are defeated, and that area now is part of Turkmenistan. So if you, there's a statement that is uh, attributed to Abdurrahman, and it says that the Turkmens and the Uzbeks disobeyed the commandment of God. They used to capture Muslims and sell them as slaves. None of their mullahs and leading men ever forbade them to do so. At last, the vengeance of God overtook them and the Russians subdued them. I wish to set them free. And then he goes on to say, now, this is where it gets, and I want you to pay attention here, okay? It is proper that as the king is an Afghan or an Auran, his tribesmen, the Aurans, should guard the frontier. Now, let me repeat that for you. It is proper that as the king is an Auran, his tribesmen, fellow Aurans, should guard the frontier. So over here, you know, you, you what you get is that um, he wasn't relying, first of all, it's funny because he accused the Uzbeks and the Turkmens of enslaving Muslims, and then he did the same thing to Hazaraz. So he kind of contradicted himself in action. But what he also said is that he doesn't have much trust in the ethnic minorities to maintain the frontiers of his kingdom. Therefore, he started to transplant forcibly his own people, his to guard the frontier because he felt they would do a better job of that. So there are numerous issues here. These areas are economically underdeveloped as well. Um, in From the mid-1880s onwards, the north suffered droughts, it suffered plagues. Uh, people started, you know, thousands of people started to flee to Russian empire to escape Abdurrahman. Uh, and that especially happened after the uh, rebellion of his cousin so thousands of people fled so what you had is an underpopulated north for a variety of different reasons droughts plagues people escaping reprisals uh, so on and so forth so the reasons are economic to develop those lands which you know there's quite a bit of empty fertile land now these are security the uh, my people should be the ones guarding the frontier i don't trust anyone he distrusted uzbeks tajiks and turkmens because he thought they were more susceptible to uh russian uh malign influence and he also thought you know this is a brilliant way as with the penal colony to break the back of these pashtun tribes force them to the north where they will act as loyal to me you see so for him it was not just an issue the way he would have seen it is not just two birds with one stone, but five birds with one stone. Okay, so uh, we have uh, Mahmoud Terzi coming back from his journeys abroad to Afghanistan, finding himself in a state that was created by uh, Amir Abdurrahman Khan, as you described so in detail. Uh, with all his uh, social, political, and ethnic uh, engineering. Uh, and basically, Mahmoud Tarzi introduced his ideas and concepts, as you uh, explained in the beginning of the show. But now, uh, we have uh, an era where um, Mahmoud Tarzi's uh, son-in-law, uh, uh, um, Amon Khan, uh, became the ruler 
Uh, he gained Afghanistan's independence. So basically those ideas of Mahmoud Tarzi, they played a major role in shaping that uh, nation state that declared itself independent. Mm. But uh, later on, we also, after the demise of that uh, King uh, Amanullah Khan, we had the Musahiban uh, dynasty. Uh, could you say that there was a certain continuity uh, in uh, these ideas of Mahmoud Tarzi during the era of Amanullah Khan and later the Musahiban? And how did that actually impact? Afghan national sense of uh, uh, the Afghan sense of national identity. So the thing is, is that I mentioned right that Tarzi wanted to um, wanted to promote the Pashto language as well. Now, one thing, final point with regard to Amir Abdurrahman, there's very little evidence to suggest that Abdurrahman, like I said, was motivated by an ideological uh, sort of axe to grind. He's all of his government communication. Uh, almost all of it entirely, I would say, was in Persian. Um, you know, he was just a standard uh, despotic king. Now, during, the, I believe, the first uh, printed works of Pashto language took place under Habibullah Khan, uh, and they were actually of my great, great uncle, uh, Maulawi Abdul Rab Akhunzada. Okay. Um, and the pamphlet, I believe, is no something... relations with uh, the other uh, famous Akhunzada of our current times. No, no relations, no relations with uh, the cu the current Akhunzada. But uh, it, during Amir uh, Amon Allah Khan's time, you had the Nizam Nama, uh, which we've discussed in a pod podcast on Amon Allah Khan, which essentially tried to, and what I re referred to earlier, tried to create a working relationship between the requirements of classical Islamic governance and the modern state. It failed. My grand, my great grandfather was at the very forefront of that. So it essentially on paper said that all Afghans are equal. All of the citizens of Afghanistan are equal citizens. It even gave the Shia, the Hazara rights under the broader spectrum of uh, Sunni Islam. Uh, and even I would say under the Musaiban, under Nadir, under Zahir, I would say there were periods, and especially because of the episode of Kalakani, of heightened sort of ethnic tension, I believe that if the way they would have seen it in the aftermath of Kalakani's overthrow was that this uh, equality project had gone out of hand, uh, because bear in mind, the Afghan national identity would not have been as baked in 1929 as it is today. So the fact that a non-Durani was a king was bad enough, let alone a non-Afghan, in the sense that Habibullah Kalakani was not a Pashtun. That the sense that Afghan was a nationality would not have been as baked as it is today. And thus, uh, because of this tug of war between Nadir and Kalakani, it would have been natural that reactionary uh, elements would have taken place and would have had some influence. But um, yeah, I would say that broadly speaking, they, the Musaiban did stick to Tarzi's uh, ideas. I mentioned in my article on uh, Amr bil Maruf how conservative a ruler Nadir was, perhaps not willingly, because he obviously had to contend with very powerful religious stakeholders as well. But he himself justified you know he swore at least on paper was dedicated to the fact that all the afghans were equal uh that he was a religious king and that he was protecting afghanistan from the british and from the russians as well so broadly speaking i would say uh, tarzi's influence has been very much sustained is long-standing and you know even now like when when we when we speak about without Let's say, Sangar, before this podcast, I'm sure you knew of Mahmoud Tarzi, but, you know, when you think of Afghan, yeah, do you not think of Islam primarily? Yes, definitely. And I think you know? this is this is a subject that we have uh, discussed uh, more often. Uh, I'm sure our audience uh, know that already, that uh, 
we basically i personally believe that uh the the identity of anyone in afghanistan for a very large part is uh, shaped by islam whether it's a pashtun tajik hazara uh, uh, nuristani pashai brawi baloch whatever all these ethnic groups islam is a very dominant part of who, their their identity their perception of who they are what they are and how they think so that's why it's not no surprise to me that uh, Mahmoud Tarzi thought that that should be a very important element of this construct that he was trying to uh, basically create but uh, what I think you know is also very important for our audience to know is that We've basically covered uh, uh, Amir Abdurrahman Khan, his attempt to create a nation state, uh, Mahmoud Tarzi, his ideas, his philosophy. Uh, we also discussed uh, where the concept of the nation state and nationalism comes from, uh, from Europe. But, uh, you know, in Afghanistan, we have many different ethnic groups uh, with their own history and heritage. Like for instance, you, as you mentioned, you know, Farsi was the language of the region. Practically mm -hmm. all ethnic groups- is, is the language of the region. Still, yes. And, yeah. and most ethnic groups uh, in the region know uh, some Farsi. Uh, so uh, when, when someone uh, like uh, Habibullah Kalakani uh, rebels against uh, Amon La Khan, uh, we've discussed this in our Amon Lahan podcast, and uh, we've we've covered this already in the past. So, if anybody wants to uh, know this, please refer back to our other episodes. But uh, basically, what is uh, happening right now, um, and not just right now, but in general, people who are very ethno-nationalistic, they have a very revisionist attitude towards history. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I know of Pashtun nationalists who idolize and glorify uh, Amir Abdurrahman Khan as a great leader. They say, well, he created the Afghan nation state and he did this and he did that. And if you say, but he and then other, the Pashtun, other Pashtun nationalists hate him for the Durand Line Agreement. Yes, exactly. So on the one hand, some people uh, idealize him and they even justify the crimes that he has committed, the amount of people that he killed. And on the other hand, we have people who um, basically say that, you know, it was a necessity what he did. And and when, when it, what it all comes ends, down to... Ends justify the means, basically. Exactly. That, this is also a very modern, uh, like... Uh, uh, in, in a sense, for us as Muslims, it is a novel idea that you trample over your Islamic ethics and beliefs uh, in order to achieve what, uh, whatever it is that you think that is more noble and more uh, lofty. And uh, this, is, this is, you know, when, when we talk about... Uh, uh, Habibullah Kalakani, people always say, well, yes, Habibullah Kalakani was a rebel. He uh, tried to overthrow a legitimate ruler, Amon La Khan. Uh, and, and then there are different theories yeah. uh, about why he did that. Some say uh, because he was an Islamist. Uh, <laughs> others say because he was an ethnic hero. Yes, but, uh, yes. Yeah. But the thing is, is that let, let's just talk about the Musaiban slightly more because this, the Musaiban, you know, now that I think about it, are the last dynasty uh, of normality in Afghanistan. And since the overthrow of the Musaiban up until now, we've discussed that as well. Yeah. But this is, but but the 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 way in which we look at the Musaiban era. Uh, is very important in order to help understand some of the currents now. So the, the thing is, as I mentioned, is that it is true that under Nadir, uh, reactionary 
sort of elements, racist elements did take place. And like I said, I just want to elaborate on this point slightly more. The Nizam Nama, let's say in 1922, 1923, uh, was the first attempt at codified governance in Afghanistan's history, in which the ruler attempt to explain and define his rule, uh, his relationship over those whom he attempted to rule. So this idea that Afghan was now a national uh, label as opposed to an ethnic one, by the time Nadir took the throne from Kalakani, this idea itself would have been about seven years old. Because, like I said, prior to this nationalist project, right, we were basically living in a pre-modern paradigm in which all of the subjects of Afghanistan were loyal to their religious king, Amir Abdurrahman. When Nadir took the throne from Kalakani, this idea that Afghan was a national label, not an ethnic one, would have barely even registered. So... This, you know, like I said, it's bad enough that it's a non-Durani. If it was a Khilji or a Kakar or a Safay that took the throne, it would have been, oh my God, what the hell's happened? But this wasn't even that. This was someone from a non-Afghan ethnic group. And that is one point, obviously, which would have, you know, really entrenched some sort of prejudice against uh, expanding the political power amongst different stakeholders as well. Masaiban as well, you have to understand, were actually British educated, so they were Indian born and raised, they were British educated, and their lingua franca Sangar, Nadir with his brothers, guess what it was? Urdu. It was Urdu. Uh, <laughs> it was actually, it was actually Urdu. Um, and the, the, you know, a lot has been written on the Musaiban. so for example, um, Ghobar, right, who is uh, Afghanistan's, let's say, one of Afghanistan's preeminent historians, uh, does accuse Nadir of using ethnicity to divide people and rule them uh, in the north, just as he accuses Nadir of doing the same uh, in Paktia. Uh, in the campaign in Shamali, uh, Nadir's Paktiawal militias and everyone in the chat or anyone that's watching, I, I love Paktia. It's not, you know, this isn't you know, me trying to say that we need to exact reparations, but it's known that Nadir's tribal militias from Paktia kidnapped uh, a lot of women from Shamali. Now, this is characterized very commonly as an act of Pashtun aggression against Tajiks. And this is a perception that persists with us to the current day as well. The Pashtuns of Paktia took these Tajik Shamali wild girls kidnapped them. And this was obviously in an honor-based society like Afghanistan. This is cause for great shame and anger. But not all Shamali wal are Tajik. And not all Tajik are Shamali wal. Because they say I've spoken to Pashtuns from Shamali who say that this thing has happened to me. In fact, I've spoken to my own relatives in Shamali who say, you know, our grandfathers told us that this thing happened. And when uh, the Taliban came to Shamali in the late 90s as well, one of the things that I've uh, actually spoken to people about as well is that Ahmad Shah Massoud would tell the local villages, Pashtuns included, as Paktiar, your nephews from Paktiar have arrived, meaning the sons of the sisters that were forcefully taken from you, right? So those uh, girls. Khwarzada, khwarzada oh my, Khwarzada, my bad, my bad, my yeah. bad, my bad. My bad, my bad. They weren't kidnapping boys, yeah. uh, not to my knowledge, but your 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 nephews have come basically saying that the bastard children of your sisters that were kidnapped have come once again, and now they're going to do the same thing. And that actually, uh, even in my village, was actually pretty effective in getting the local Pashtun villages, local Pashtun villages, to ally with Masood because they were manipulated. So when we talk about the late 90s, once again, of you know, Mullah Fazl, Mazlum, and Mazlum Yar back then, and then he became Mazlum because he went to Guantanamo, which was very clever wordplay. When when these guys went to Shamali and burnt uh, all of the vineyards and the trees and the, the crops and everything of the sort, this is once again characterized as an act of Pashtun uh, hostility against Tajiks. But the same thing happened in my Pashtun village as well here. You see what I'm saying? So these are, these are some of the lingering things from the Musaiban era that still affect us uh, to this day and uh, at the same time you know uh, this impetus to settle the north because there had been 
I believe that the Uzbek leader, Ibrahim Beg, actually declared independence in the north after Kalakani had been overthrown and Nadir had to reassert his control. This push to force Pashtuns north once again took place. In fact, some Pashtuns were forced to purchase land in Qunduz, right? And Qunduz, this is the point where it transforms from a swamp into an area that is very agriculturally fertile in which it's producing cotton and so on and so forth but then in 1936 as well uh, Hashim Khan tried to make Pashto the sole official language it failed pretty badly as well but um there's also within this period the development of Pashto standardized Pashto that can be used so let me give you an example Sangar you know my and I swear I'm not trying to make this about my family as well but you know someone's uh so, you know, my um, great grandfather, Mawlawi Abdul Wasir, the man, the religious scholar behind the Nizam Nama. Now, he wrote a Pashto to Dari uh, dictionary. Okay. He wrote a dictionary. He wrote many texts in Dari, but he's called the Pashto nationalist. Why? Because he tried to also write in Pashto. So, because this attempt at promoting Pashto to parity with Dari, right, has been seen so suspiciously. Anyone that tries to promote or standardize the Pashto language in this period is seen as someone who is by default hostile to Farsi. The same thing, you know, for example, you see it with um, another guy, Abdul Hay Habibi, right? Abdul Hay Habibi has books written in Dari on the Awliya of Khurasan, right? This is a Kandari Pashtun guy, supposedly, you know, ideologically dedicated to obliterating Farsi and Khurasan and, you know, all of the glories of Persian civilization, writing books on the awliya of Khurasan. Do you see what I'm saying here? So we need to decouple this idea that anyone within this period that was writing in Pashto was necessarily a Pashtun nationalist. Did Pashtun nationalists exist? Yes. Were they stakeholders? Yes. For example, uh, Nadir's foreign minister, Faiz Muhammad Zakaria, who was also a Muhammad Zay, was a Pashtun nationalist. You had that Gul Muhammad Khan Momant guy who was in the... Yes, he was a... But is it accurate to say that five decades of Musaiban rule was entirely just Pashtun nationalism on steroids? I wouldn't say so. In the promotion of the Pashto language, the, the way the Musaiban would have seen it is that Dari is so predominant because it's been utilized by governments for centuries and now this is our golden opportunity with a state in our hands to promote Pashto to the glory that it deserves and that is but ultimately you know personally I'm not really a fan of that because I'm a big big fan of the parity of languages to national languages but what I want to say is that this idea that, you know, anyone that promoted Pashto language in this period or tried to standardize it to make it easier for nomads to communicate with their government does not necessarily mean that they were hostile to Dari. And, uh, and one more thing is that, uh, you know, uh, one of the important characteristics of this uh, idea, nationalism, or even ethno nationalism is that um, obviously it's it's emotional and it's uh, uh, it appeals to emotion. It is also very uh, irrational. Like for instance, uh, what we acknowledge here is that yes, we had rulers in Afghanistan who did certain things, mm -hmm. and and those are documented facts. But then. Uh, we also know that Farsi as a language uh, is so widespread across the whole region. Like even in North India, it was an official language. Yeah. And the it French of the Orient, as the exactly. British called it. Yeah. yeah. And it wasn't just because people all uh, voluntarily agreed that this should be the case. No, it was by the force of the, the ruler, the, the, yeah. the one who was in power, uh, 
promoted the language because that was the l language of the court. So uh, the fact that we have all these different ethnic groups from North India to uh, even Iraq and Central Asia, everyone uh, who is uh, basically from all different ethnic groups, they all speak Farsi, is because it was forced upon them. Now it was, it was the language of government. Yes. Now is that is that is that an oppression? Would you say that those people were oppressed because they were they were uh, they were uh, it was expected from them to learn that language? It's like even here in Europe you have some uh, people uh, like very irrational and nationalist uh, minorities refugees who came here as as uh, migrant workers 50 60 70 years ago and up until the 1990s here in the Netherlands if you would tell those minorities you need to speak Dutch because you live in this country they would say you're a be you're being racist <laughs> like th this kind of attitude where people think that anything that is demanded from them from the state is by by default racist and oppressive is 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 uh, is prevalent in many societies and this is yeah. also how people say well uh, if the rulers in Afghanistan ex expected from everyone to learn Pashto or at least accept Pashto as one of the official languages, then obviously that was uh, an act of and genocide. The, the thing is, is that, like I said, we've explained Tarzi as well. So when Tarzi has, you know, highlighted rightly or wrongly, Tarzi has highlighted the Pashto language as the feature which makes Afghanistan unique. It's like the pillar, one of the pillars of Afghan nationalism. So when you have a state at your disposal and you are motivated by Tarzi's ideals, right? Of course, you're going to promote the Pashto language. Like it's, it's a no, you <laughs> do you know what I mean? Of course, that, that, that is what you're going to do, rightly or wrongly. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it translates into hostility for other languages. So for example, one person that was really big on this is a man we know as Sardar Muhammad Dawood Khan. But Sardar Muhammad Daud Khan also organized festivals which promoted all of the minority cultures and dresses and languages and whatever of Afghanistan. So yes, a very big Afghan nationalist. Was the Afghan nationalism heavily infused by Pashto and Pashtuns? Yes. Does it necessarily mean that at the same time it's on an obliterationist course toward minorities? Not necessarily. Did those people with those tendencies exist? Absolutely. Of course they did. We can't deny that either but you know to conflate one with the other i would say is a really poor reading of um of history like for example if you read uh, robar's book robar by the way amazing historian but when it comes to his critiques of nadir i take it with a pinch of salt because nadir was forced into an ultra conservative government by nur al mashayikh right by the mujadidi clan and the, all of the other religious stakeholders so the fact that he wasn't progressive enough is not necessarily his own will but rather his own constraint posed by the religious establishment but Robar attributes Nadir's ultra conservatism to the fact that he was a British puppet who was dedicated toward destroying Afghanistan and making it backward but he's a brilliant historian nonetheless but Robar says that Nadir would uh, wanted all Nadir wanted oh but speaking of Tarzi Tarzi was opposed to the common themes in the poetry of our region women wine so on and so forth and i believe there's a quote of his don't quote me verbatim where he said you know the time of you know all of the pleasures is over now is a time of the tractor and the railway and so on and so forth nadir in you know whenever he would uh, he got this guy to read uh, saadi's gulistan on radio to basically distract him and Robar says this was an attempt to keep the masses you know down in their carnal pleasures and their carnal instincts or whatever whatever the hell it was now why is a guy who is apparently ideologically dedicated toward destroying the persian language having the gulistan read on the radio rahman baba existed as well right why didn't he have rahman baba do you see so the point i'm making is it's uh, the point I always make is it's complex dummy. 
right? It's not. <laughs> okay, it's not black right, and white. Okay, okay. I think we have laid a very thick foundation for what we're going to discuss now, uh, which is our current modern uh, state of affairs. We discussed uh, the philosophical origins of nationalism, national identity, and the nation state. We discussed the creation of the Afghan nation state and uh, the, 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 the social construct around it of what is Afghan national identity. Uh, but now uh, I think it is uh, important to uh, ask, okay, so what we observe uh, in writings of some of these Afghans, uh, of people who don't even say, they don't identify as Afghans, they say we are Afghanistani, or uh, we don't even accept the notion of Afghanistan, we are Khorasani, mm, and people who advocate for partition of Afghanistan, all these uh, groups that are primarily active online, uh, what they're advocating for and what they believe and all of these tensions where does it come from like uh, when did this all start uh, is it something out of the blue after the fall of the uh, so-called republic under u.s occupation in august 1 2021 or is there more to it i would say there's more to it it has uh, roots that go back further and it's uh, it, it ties into the things we've discussed this attempt to make a a distinct Afghan state. And after a while, we saw that the Afghan state even tried to make its own distinct Persian, right? Because Persian was a national language, just like Pashto was. So both of them needed to be standardized according to what Kabul wanted. Now, Persian, Farsi, or if I'm being really Khorasani here, Parsi, right? became Dari. Now, Dari is not a term that was used by, that was created. It's a very historic term. I think even um, Allama Iqbal uses the word Dari. Dari was standardized in accordance with the local Kabuli dialect. Uh, Pashto was standardized as well in accordance with the central Ghilji dialect. So wait, this is another point as well, Sangar. This, the fact that Farsi was called Dari is commonly used to say, look, this is the attempt of the state to suppress our identity of our language, which is called Farsi, and it standardized one language. Well, as a southern Shah speaker, the fact that um, the standard script, the, sc the standard national script says Shoe instead of Soe, and it says Khe instead of Sha, I feel very oppressed. <laughs> and now I'm going to add. I'm going to advocate for Kandari separatism. Do you see what I'm saying? So, yes. so it comes back to Tarzi trying to make things unique and the standard thing. But if we're going specifically toward um, toward why we've had such an outbreaking of you know these revisionist readings of history, uh, it's because in the 60s and 70s we had a blossoming of different political parties in Afghanistan. You had the Sholayis. You had the Khalqis, the Parchamis, and you had the Sitamis, right? Now the you Sitamis, also had the Saza, Saza and uh, Kama, and there were many, many there were, there were many. parties, yes. And this, this happened, by the way, uh, as a result of the same constitution which made uh, Dari an official language and Pakhto an official language. Not Pashto, Pakhto, which is going to make me very angry. But that constitution allowed political organizations to be formed. Now, one such organization was something called Setame Milli, which means national oppression. And it was founded by an ideologue called um, Tahir Badakhshi. Yeah. Uh, Tahir Badakhshi, uh, I believe, was actually an Uzbek from Badakhshan. Uh, but, you know, uh, Persianized, basically someone that you would call a Farsi or a Tajik. And what he was, was actually a former member of the Communist Party. And this is where something that we know today as critical race theory starts to become applied to Afghanistan, except in the 60s, where all events are basically perceived through the prism of class struggle, as socialists or more accurately communists tend to do. And what class struggle is, for those that don't know, is that Marx and those that followed him articulated the idea 
that all conflicts in human history can be boiled down to a struggle over power and resources between one class and the other class. And these were the wheels that churned history. But then when you start really applying that idea, it doesn't have to be the landowners versus the peasants. It doesn't have to be the aristocracy over the working class. It can also equally be applied to genders, which is why uh, you know, uh, for example, if you're looking at the latest uh, news coming out of the US, I was I was looking at some of the placards today, Sangad, and I was like, men, stay away from uh, stay away from my vagina because abortion is my right, so on and so forth. But once you start applying the notion of class struggle and the general oppressed versus oppressed, oppressor dynamic, this is what Satam Mili started to do. So whilst it was correct in saying that Afghanistan had had a very brutal history, uh, at a very you know, in which people had been oppressed, it started to mischaracterize this as something that was solely of one ethnicity over another. This is where, and this faction, Satam Mili, whilst it wasn't very influential at the time, and it had competition in the marketplace of ideas after the post-1964 constitution, it started to become more and more enmeshed in more mainstream uh, political parties and as you describe that uh you know what we need to remind our audience of is that we we started this whole uh podcast by discussing the philosophical origins of nationalism the romanticism you know the the, the romantic school uh, in political philosophy uh, jean-jacques rousseau and why we did that why we started off with that is because all the way from the beginning till this point now what we want you as our audience to understand is that today um whether it's now in 2022 or uh, in the 1960s of Afghanistan, when people started promoting ideas of, uh, you know, one ethnic group uh, opposed to other ethnic group and this struggle and conflict between ethnic groups, uh, these perceptions are based on a lot of uh, myths and irrational uh uh you know attitudes like yes there are historical facts of oppression crimes uh, massacres and whatnot committed by states by rulers uh and and we know through study of history why those rulers justified whatever it is that they did but what happens is that uh, if you look from a very romanticized perspective, you identify a particular group as a victim, as the perpetual victim, and the other group as a, an oppressor. Like uh, in Marxism, uh, the working class is glorified and uh, uh, idealized as you know noble savages or noble people uh you see in uh, former soviet union i don't know if any of you guys have traveled to former soviet union uh, they have by and large removed a lot of soviet era artwork but when we used to go to uzbekistan to russia you would see these huge murals with uh mosaics or statues of uh, farmers, men and women working uh, or people working in factories with big muscles and big gigantic people. And this kind of icon, uh, icons and uh, depictions of working class is part of that romanticized perspective on the working class. And this is, this is in a Marxist uh, uh, you know, paradigm. But then if the same uh, concept is translated to ethnicity or nationality, you see like people describing a, per uh, a particular ethnic group as more noble, more uh, enlightened, more sophisticated, more cultured, m more uh, physically stronger, uh, uh, more capable of uh, creating more progeny and whatnot. All these things, what is described when, when people glorify their own identity, their own 
uh, race, their own ethnic uh, identity and nationality, it all stems from that concept of uh, romanticism. Uh, the romanticized uh, idea of the self, the, the, your uh, social uh, group, and, and this is what we also observe when we see people being uh, seriously irrational and, and, and very uh, hostile towards other people. Uh, even in Western societies, we have different uh, uh, white supremacist groups who uh, feel threatened by refugees and they think that all these brown and black people come to Europe to impregnate white women and uh erase the white race from existence that like there are people who actually write an entire books about that yeah. so we also see that in afghanistan with uh whether it's pashtun nationalism like authors such as uh ismail yun uh and then we have uh, tajik ethno-nationalist leaders such as latif pedram uh these people uh what they are advocating for and how they uh, try to gain a following within their own ethnic group, they appeal to those same irrational concepts of, you know, the glorified uh, self, the glorified uh, ethnicity and identity. And, and this, is, this is something that you should be aware of when we proceed from this moment onwards discussing these political trends. Uh, now, Walid, um, if we look at uh, the political parties prior to the communist revolution, because obviously, uh, as, as discussed, these ideas about uh, ethnicity and nationality, uh, it was sort of basically uh, adopted by and large by the secular uh, groups in Kabul, the secular parties, the, those who were also... Left-leaning parties. Exactly. But before we go into that, uh, according to your understanding of the Islamist parties, uh, were they also to a certain extent uh, inspired by uh, ethno-nationalism? Like, is there a history of documented ethno-nationalism uh, like among parties such as maybe Hizb Islami? Or any other no, part? Not that I'm not that I'm aware of. So funnily enough, you mentioned Hezbi Islami. Maybe Obaidullah Bahid is watching. Who knows? But um, uh, Hezbi, so Hikmatyar was actually from amongst those Pashtuns that, uh, whose parents had uh, moved to Qunduz, and I believe they were from around Zabul Sharana. Um, they, they so they went to Imam Sahib. They're from uh, Urgun. Urgun, okay, yeah. Paktika. Paktika, yeah. So, um, the, and that's why his accent is still slightly, it's southern-ish, but he likes to mix it up. Um, but, but the thing is, is that I wouldn't say that there is uh, such an indication. I mean, if you listen to the stories about Hikmat Yad, it's like he used to be a communist. He killed someone. He did this. He did that. And I've listened to stories about Ahmad Shah Masood as well, saying that he was always a racist and this, that, the other. But I wouldn't say there's anything of much substance to say um, that there is such a thing. I would say that the reason, the initial reason why some of these parties began to assume a more ethnic character is purely based on uh, geography, on regions. And it's the same thing that's reflected on the uh, left as well. So Parcham were more uh, urban, uh, Dari speakers, Pashtuns included amongst them, of course, you would know uh, more than I would about that Sangar. And the Khalqis were obviously much more rurally based. And I don't even want to say rurally based, almost entirely <laughs> Southeast Afghanistan based. Uh, and the same thing with Jamiat as well. So areas, let's say, like Badakhshan, like uh, Panjshir, um, Takhar, and so on and so forth would lean more toward Jamiat. Uh, areas like Kapisa, let's say maybe 50-50, Shamali maybe 50-50. Uh, but then when you go further down to Kabul itself, uh, you know, it's more Hizb territory. So, you know, the fact that there's going to be an ethnic divide is natural. But I would say in the uh, late 80s and the early 90s is, uh, is when things began to really change uh, from an ideological perspective. 
And with regards to uh, the communists in Afghanistan, uh, like we had uh, basically three different main communist trends in Afghanistan, okay? So just roughly categorize them in three. Uh, the first group were the Maoists. Basically, yeah. you have a Marxist doctrine. Akram Yari. Akram Yari and yeah. those guys. Yeah, so yeah. the Marxist uh, theory about uh, uh, everything related to economics and uh, change in society uh, has been interpreted in a certain way by Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the communist revolution in Russia. And that particular interpretation is called Leninism. Okay? Yeah. Basically, uh, Marx... That particular tafsir. Yes. Marx said that uh, in order to bring about a revolution of the working class, a society needs to reach a certain conditions. And one of those conditions is that the society must be industrialized. Okay? So Marx believed that... Um, a communist revolution will come after industrialization because he was observing uh, an industrialized uh, Manchester and region in, in, in UK. But Russia was not industrialized. M Russia was a pre-modern, not industrialized society. And most uh, Russians were farmers and illiterate. But still, Lenin believed that a communist revolution by the proletariat in in russia was necessary and this is called leninism so yeah. leninism is one particular version of marxism and then there is a another one that is called maoism and maoism is even more radical and more violent because if the you great leap forward and all of those guys exactly so if you study mao uh, his uh, uh uh history how he uh basically took over whole of china uh how violent he was and how he basically uh, invented the modern concept of guerrilla warfare uh, you see that that's a more even more radical uh interpretation of marxism uh and then you have this academic Marxism, the, the, the more intellectual Marxism of the non-violent uh, uh, people who write and talk and philosophize. Now, in Afghanistan, we had these three different movements. We had the Leninist Marxists that could be identified as, you know, the Khalqis, the the men who were rural Pashtuns who studied in military academies or abroad and then they were introduced to Marxism. The Khalqi Pashtuns, they uh, basically transitioned to Pashtun nationalists. Uh, the Maoists uh, were primarily uh, of ethnic minorities. There were many Pashtun Maoists as well, but there were many Hazara there were Qizilbash Maoists. There were Shiites who were, became, you know, convinced by Maoist thought. And uh, those uh, Maoists then became like a Hazara ethno-nationalists. Uh, and then you had this uh, urban elite who were more the academic and philosophical Marxists. They were the Parchamis, uh, people who were the flat caps and uh, smoke cigarettes they're the ones i find the most annoying <laughs> <laughs> yeah so 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 the urban the urban marxist uh, uh was uh the parchamis in afghanistan and they became uh tajik ethno nationalists because a lot of those uh people were tajik so aside from uh clearly ethno-nationalist parties that emerged in 60s and 70s like Saza and Kama and whatnot and Sittam uh, Mili of Tahir Badakhshi. Later on, the Khalqis also became uh, ethno-nationalist. They became Pashtun ethno-nationalist. The Parchamis became Tajik ethno-nationalist and the Maoists became Hazara ethno-nationalist. And you also have, obviously, there were Uzbeks among the Parchamis and yeah. among the Khalqis. Uh, you had so, Pashtuns and the Parchamis. 
Yes. So all these these different Marxist groups uh, in Afghanistan, they were all young men and women who studied in the 1960s and 70s in Afghanistan or abroad. Uh, they became the intellectual elite, you know, the, 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 the leaders of the society after the revolution, the communist revolution and the Soviet occupation. And these people were also the ones who uh, were capable of fleeing to Western countries, to North America, to uh, uh, Britain. Uh, and having a more enduring influence. Exactly. And, and now... I have one question before yes, we get yeah, into yes. this. It's a bit ridiculous, but you're, you're a bit older than me, Sangha, yeah. so you know a bit more things about, you know, the, 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 mm -hmm. the old country, as they call it. You know this tendency of like speaking really like as if you're electrified and breathing really heavily like Mardome Afghanistan. Like, is that a Parchami thing or was that just a collective schizophrenia in Kabul back in the day? Uh, this is a, a Karmali way of speech, okay? Babrak Karmal, Babrak Karmal was a very eloquent speaker. He was in the first, you know, the, the decade of democracy, as they say in Afghanistan. He got beaten up by Mawla in Parliament. Yeah, 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 yeah. So Babrak Karmal was a communist. He was one of the first communists who was elected into Afghan parliament in the late 60s. And he was a magnificent orator, like in, mm -hmm. in the parliament, he would stand and he would orate. And this uh, way of speech is also an influence of romanticism. Okay, so it's, 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 uh, it's all about being extremely artistic and passionate and appealing to people's passions and emotions and that's why you see that the the, the leftist elite the intellectuals uh, who are of the karmali persuasion they 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 love to talk okay. like that rafaqo emruz yakruz kabir you know this this is this is yeah. this is a karmalist way of speaking and okay what is important to note is that uh uh, when we described uh, romanticism in the beginning of the show, uh, all of these aspects of romanticism you can like pinpoint it in in yeah. Afghan Marxists and the uh, genealogy is very clear. Exactly, exactly, and 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 this is also something that we should uh, actually uh, maybe investigate further. Is how in literature you can see back. Like, like the way people write, like uh, um, Garzai Laik, the son of Suleiman Laik, uh, he's very active on Facebook and he writes a lot of stuff. Uh, he is a very educated man, like uh, he speaks like six, seven languages. But when he writes, when he tries to make a point, when he writes in Pashto or in Dari, he writes in a way that most people don't even know what he's saying. Yeah. And this is because there is this idea that we are the intellectual elite and we are above everyone else and we need to communicate in a way where we can express our superiority over others this, this reminds me of um you know uh, my um article on anas Haqqani. you know it starts it starts off with uh, him saying that modern pashto poetry is just too inaccessible bland and this is exactly what he was referring to uh, I would assume as well, uh, because I obviously interviewed him on poetry, and yeah, it's it's true. It's like it's like a contest to be as inaccessible and remote from the uneducated man as possible. And yeah, I, I see it even and, now. And this is ironic because the ethno nationalists also do this. They, on the one hand, they identify themselves as members of the masses, like uh, the members of the uh, particular ethnic group. Like I speak uh, Dari in a very typical Kabuli dialect. Okay, uh, I come from a generation in Afghanistan where we spoke Dari in the way it was common in Kabul. Uh, but you see that the ethno-nationalist uh, Dari speakers or Farsi speakers now 
when they even tweet if you read their tweets the tweet is written in a very archaic uh, farsi using very old farsi words that have died out they mm -hmm. only exist in books yeah. normal people don't talk like that like even yeah. in uh, in afghanistan uh, whether you are in herat or in badakhshan or where wherever where you know farsi is the uh, language of the majority people don't talk like that so why do people feel this necessity to to express this themselves in their own native language but in a way that is very inaccessible to the people mm -hmm. that they claim to represent this is because it is a political act writing is a political act tweeting is a political act and it's not so much about the message but also the way you bring uh, you you convey that and message. the bravado exactly and and this this is this is why when we uh, observe uh, a lot of uh, political activism now among whether it's pashtun nationalists or tajik nationalists or hazara nationalists uh, these aspects of their own identity and culture uh, is not always a reflection of the common man in Afghanistan mm -hmm. like the common man the common Pashtun or the common Tajik or the T Hazara or Uzbek uh, their list of priorities in life are totally different than mm -hmm. the intellectual who uh, has these lofty ideas about identity and history and, and this is why they, they also speak in a different language so yeah. you you would find yourself even like uh, in Afghanistan. Uh, let, I'll give you a very 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 simple example. Like you know uh, nowadays Twitter Spaces are very popular. Okay. Yeah. So if you go to a Farsi Twitter Space or a Pashto Twitter Space, where you find a mixture of people who are currently living in Afghanistan and people who are basically the common folk of Afghanistan yeah. and you find a, a space where there are a few speakers who are clearly part of an intellectual elite mm -hmm. while they try to claim like yes we represent you as an ethnic group and it is us against the others and uh, we are in a existential crisis of uh, you know ex existential conflict against other ethnic groups you see that they end up arguing and fighting with each other yeah and the reason for that is that the intellectual the, the 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 sophisticated man or woman who believes in these ideas of nationalism and ethnicity you know ethno-nationalism they are very distant from a lot of people who face very urgent concerns like uh, poverty starvation unemployment uh whatnot so that's why uh we when we talk about uh ethno-nationalism in afghanistan uh yes there is oppression like uh, there are like the taliban during their first uh, emirate uh in 1997 1998 you discussed at length what happened in mazar uh, what happened in Bamiyan, in Yakaulang, and also all these things are documented historical facts. Uh, so based on those historical events, people have a uh, valid uh, reason to be scared of the Taliban. Yeah. Right? So, so we can have a, this conversation about where, to, to what extent does this government... Uh, prevent such crimes or do they actually let's, believe believe that that let, that yes let's let's bring the conversation to the climax okay which is what is going on today so today what we have is um the taliban are in control of afghanistan afghanistan is an emirate and what we've seen over the past couple of days is an offensive that was launched in Panjshir by um the National Resistance Front, as they call themselves, an offensive that in the first few hours was claiming to have captured many districts and um, 
funnily enough, I actually messaged people in Kabul because I was reading all of these tweets at the time. And I was messaging people in Kabul, like, can you confirm what's going on? And so on and so forth. And the response I got was a resounding, which is uh which is for, for those of us who don't speak pashto um uh, it's basically everyone here is asleep but we'll find out what happened the next morning and so over the next few days it's emerged that this offensive did take place and uh it didn't succeed in the sense that its aim was to seize a couple of districts it failed and there have been casualties now obviously you know media coverage has been limited it's been skewed there's been the low there's been the fake news and whatever but what we've seen is a a hashtag called stop tajik genocide in which it's alleged that tajiks are being genocided in um in areas like panjshir and uh, and arab and so on and so forth and this comes back to what i said uh, earlier on, Sangar, in 1929, it was a uh, you know a mass campaign against Tajiks because a few hundred, uh, maybe even a few thousand people were killed in Shamali, uh, and the assumption was that Shamali equals Tajik and Tajik equals equals Shamali, and the same thing is being done now. But what this is part of is a broader uh, characterization of Afghanistan. And this is when I'm going to get into my rant, Sangar. Okay, yes. this is part of a broader characterization of Afghanistan and its sort of different power dynamics through the lens of ethnicity. So one of the things moving away from Panjshir and Tajik genocide to another genocide that's well, that we're told is taking place is the genocide of Hazaras. Now this one has more merit to it because the Hazaras are being targeted uh, by Daesh. Now. Speaking of these ethno-nationalist spaces, what you know, this Sitami narrative, once again, to remind everyone, is that the Pashtuns are the oppressors and they're oppressing everyone else, all of the minorities. But now what it does is that it draws parallels between Daesh today and Amir Abdurrahman in the 1890s, because the Azaras are being killed then, they're being killed now. Pretty simple, right? Wrong. Because the reality is, is that, first of all, not every Azara is a Shia. And not every Shia is a Hazara in Afghanistan. There are non-Hazara Shia communities in Afghanistan, like the Qizilbash. So a couple of months ago, the Daesh, they attacked a Shia masjid of Farsiwan or Qizilbash in Kandahar. They also attacked um, Sunnis commemorating the Mawlid, right? And there are also... There are also Sunni Hazaras that are not being attacked. Ghorband, I believe, is one area in which the Hazaras are Sunni. And I've actually spoken to people who say that the Hazaras in Ghorband deny they are Hazara. They say they are Tajik, so they can be more closely associated with being Sunni. So what this shows us is that there's a sectarian element here as well. When Amir Abdurrahman declared the jihad against the Hazara, it's not because he said the Hazara are, you know, inferior race Right? It was on the basis of religion. So, but now, if we're going to equivocate Daesh with Amir Abdurrahman, we know from historical records that Amir Abdurrahman believed very heavily in astrology and visiting the <laughs> visiting the graves of the awliya where he believed karamat would take place. So Daesh today, if they got their hands on Amir Abdurrahman, they would behead him for kufr and shirk. Furthermore, Sangar, if we look at the composition of Daesh, and there's been research done into this by the likes of Burhan Usman, what we find is that the profile of the average Daesh recruit differs from the Taliban's. So the Taliban's classically has been rural Pashtun madrasa educated. Though that has changed in recent years. With the Daeshis, is you have more ethnic minorities, specifically Uzbeks, and not just Uzbeks of Afghan nationality, but actual Uzbeks. Now, if this were a thing from where Uzbekistan. People are- Uzbek, from, from Uzbek. Now, if this were a reality in which people are being targeted for having East Asian features like the Hazaras uh, commonly do, the the people that are attacking the Hazaras, Uzbeks, amongst others, also have East Asian features. So, how, do you see what? I, so they they very often look like the very people they are attacking, whilst the Sunni Hazaras are not being attacked. Here. This so, is also the reason why they can easily infiltrate in Hazara communities because exactly. the people that they sent there, 
They have same physical features as the others. This isn't this isn't to throw the Uzbeks under the bus here, by the way, but the, we're just talking about, you know, the different uh, physical characteristics of these different ethnicities. So to draw a parallel between Amir Abdurrahman then and Daesh now as all being part of a Pashtun long tail of oppression, you're either blatantly misinformed or you have an agenda. There's no two ways to put this, right? You cannot, in any circumstance, equivocate between the two. I um, just, just one important thing that I noticed: someone wrote, "There is a Pashtun Deobandi Salafi." Uh, no, uh, there's a Pashtun nationalist Deobandi Salafi uh, conspiracy against Hazaras and Tajiks in Afghanistan. So, a Pashtun nationalist. We explain that how nationalism is a secular idea. Uh, Deobandis, like the Hanafi Deobandis, they are uh, at currently basically more or less at war with the Salafi movement, which is Daesh, uh, who reject the Hanafi madhab. Uh, that all of these groups with totally opposing views and beliefs that they are colluded with one another and they form a unity against other people based on ethnicity yeah like yeah. like this is this the, the like for people outside afghanistan let's just say you would argue that the a protestant uh, catholic uh irish republican nationalist servant of the her majesty the queen is uh is out here to oppress afghans or a uh transgender uh, 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 queer activist uh, black uh, white supremacist that uh, no, uh, it's like I've been accused of being a um, Pashtun nationalist Daeshi ISI puppet <laughs> right? but, yeah, but, so, yeah, yeah. but, but let, let's come back so, so what we have are these narratives so the Hazara uh, is one of them right what we have is a very retrospective, uh, you know, revisionist reading of history. So from the 90s, the tale of the civil war is explained as follows. The civil war kicked off because Pashtuns didn't like Tajik as a president. No matter, irrespective of the fact that the only person that didn't like the Peshawar Accords was Gulbuddin. You know, when uh, Haqqani refused to help Gulbuddin in the civil war, when Maulavi Saeed Muhammad Nabi and Yunus Khalis refused to get involved when uh, Mullah Naqib in Kandahar was loyal to Jamiat and to Rabani. These things, all of these Pashtuns and Rabani side don't matter. This is once again another tale of Pashtun aggression against minorities. It also ignores the fact that and this is documented. Do you know um, Sangar uh, Hikmatyar's, uh, almost his deputy, uh, Abdul Sabur Farid? Yes, Tajik. Tajik. Tajik from uh, Kapisa, Khoistan area, right? And this is documented. In order to get him to defect to Jamiat, Rabani told him that he, Farid, and Masood could form a Tajik triumvirate, right? So the point here, and obviously Sabur uh, Farid rejected this, but the, but the point here is that not only did the majority of Pashtuns or influential Pashtuns not back Hikmatyar in this war? But at the same time, Rabani was also busy playing ethnic politics as well. If this whole story can be explained by Pashtuns versus Tajiks, why was Mullah Ahmad receiving help from Masood to crush Hikmatyar? Right? <laughs> why was Dostum helping Hikmatyar against Rabani and Masood? Why? was Hikmatyar allied with Mazari against the Taliban. The 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 whole the absolute the, you know the the holes in this story and this narrative are so many to count. And I'm gonna be really blunt and honest here. It's particularly weak the the Pedrami Tajik nationalist argument that we have today of stop Tajik genocide and this is all about the it's the weakest argument that I've ever heard quite quite frankly just on the basis of a couple of years of um just looking at the civil war you know like and this is unfortunately um 
you know, it's something that we've seen that is believed at the highest levels. So I always mention this, that Amrullah Saleh opposed peace in 2010 because this is a Pashtun conspiracy, right? What these people don't realize is that, yes, there, there are a lot of Pashtuns and they exist in a lot of political organizations. We have to be honest about that. But the only thing that that proves is that, one, there's a lot of them, and two, that they have different ideological persuasions. So when they inevitably deal with each other on the political table, it's not a, <laughs> it's not a conspiracy <laughs> to make everyone say pantun. It's just the way that it is. Right. Yeah, and this 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 comes down to the uh, matter that we discussed earlier. That in order to be an ethno nationalist or a nationalist, you have to adopt a irrational attitude. You yeah. have to have a uh, uh, irrational uh, attitude, and you have to uh, create an alternative reality based on myths and. Uh, things that are not based on reality. Uh, yeah. You have to do that. Otherwise, uh, like, it, it doesn't work. Like, how yeah. are you going to convince anyone wh wh who is a reasonable and rational person that uh, the Salafi Jihadi uh, movement as Daesh that doesn't recognize national boundaries and national identity and is a global uh, globalist movement that that I, that particular group is in cahoots with Pashtun nationalist uh, Ashraf Ghani and Hamdullah Moheb and the Deobandi Hanafi Taliban all at the same time trying to promote Pashtun hegemony uh, yeah. in Afghanistan like you have to say uh, bye bye and, and take total distance from any kind of uh, you know rational thought and reason. Otherwise, it doesn't work. Yeah. But but the, the 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 most amusing and funny thing about this matter is that the proponents of this idea are not people who are illiterate. No, there are people who actually have PhDs. Yes. They, they boast about their education online on their profiles, like I have studied this and that, and I have a degree yeah. from there and there. And here, voila, this is my yeah. uh, intellectual product. Uh, Accept I mean, this, please. I mean, the thing is, like, I, I shared an article a while back that was basically saying that Masud ended the period of Pashtun. So after Kalakani, it said another period of Pashtun uh, hegemony was inaugurated that was removed by Masood in 1992 when he defeated the communists. Now, this is when you're like, this guy, the author of this piece is one of the key ideologues. This is where you take a step back and you're like, whoa, whoa. There are a couple of assumptions being made here. One, that the communist regime was an expression of the Pashtun ethnicity. That's number one. Number two, that Masud was the only one to end the communist regime, no one else, which leads into number three, that the majority of the Mujahideen were Tajik. Those are three claims. The third one, the third one is absolutely not true because the, the, the um, Mujahideen were composed of Tajik, Hazara, Uzbek, Turkmen, Pashtun, right? So then the, the Tajiks are not going to be the absolute majority within that grouping. In fact, some Russian sources say that Pashtuns were the total majority in the Mujahideen, but I'm not going to go by that too much because they're just going to be estimates. But the fact that the communist regime was an expression of Pashtunism, right? And the fact that Masud ended it alone. Sorry, what? And then you've got claims, let's say, for example, of Najibullah, being a Pashtun nationalist, to which I reply, maybe if he was a Pashtun nationalist, it would have been better for him because it would have stopped his Tajik generals from colluding with Masud and trying to create Khorasan. I'm, I'm joking, by the way. They obviously, that wasn't the intention. But maybe, maybe if Najibullah had actually empowered people like Dostum, not empowered people like Dostum and Nabi Azibi and so on and so forth, maybe if he actually was a Pashtun nationalist, who knows, maybe things would have turned out differently. 
right? But this is the, the late 80s and the early 90s, I would say, are the most formative period of the most, dis are the most formative years of an ensuing mo most destructive period uh, within Afghanistan in terms of not just sheer casualty count, but in terms of what it did for the narrative and shaping the imaginations of so many thousands of people. Now that we have discussed all of that, let's talk about partition. Okay, so this okay. is the last bit because we have even surpassed two hours, but uh, the last portion we've saved for the last moment, you know. So uh, you explained how the Afghan nation state was created. Mm -hmm. how this nation state was a consequence of you know a conflict between two empires the russian empire to the north the british empire to the south so our national borders uh if you will are a product of a conflict that you know lasted for decades but whatever we are now confined in that particular geography uh and I explained in the beginning of the show that in the pre-modern world where there was no such thing as a international border and where there was no such thing as a nation state and a national identity, in that particular pre-modern world, people didn't have homogenized identities and homogenized language and homogenized culture. So people lived alongside one another, speaking different languages and having different customs and different values, uh, especially in our region, like Afghanistan, Pakistan, India. I think I've told this story once before uh, in one of our shows, but there was this uh, Indian Hindu a uh, researcher here at Leiden University. I met him at the library, our university library, and he was uh, there to uh, study uh, old ancient Islamic uh, literature. And I said, why are you doing this? W what is your field of uh, study? He said, actually, I'm writing my dissertation about how uh, people in the north of India opposed British Empire and a major aspect of that resistance against British Empire was uh, that Muslims from the north of India uh, opposed British Empire and before the British Empire, the Mughal Empire uh, was ruling over that region. And the same groups of people who opposed the British were also the same people who rebelled against the Mughals. And those people were ethnic Pashtuns from Afghanistan who settled in different parts of North India. And as part of local community, they identified with the local community in India despite being settlers from Afghanistan, and they made common cause with the Hindus against the Mughals and later against the Hindus. So this is, this is just one example of how complex the world, the pre-modern world was, because yeah. people from different ethnicities, different culture, different language, and even different religions lived in certain parts of the world and they didn't identify as, okay, I'm a Muslim, uh, I'm part of the Mughal Empire, so that's why I should be opposed to the Hindu and support the Mughal Empire. No, that was not the case. And later on, when the British Empire came into existence, then you had also a different uh, paradigm. But in Afghanistan, we have had Uzbeks, Tajiks, uh, Turkmens, and Pashtuns, who all were part of a certain uh, ruling uh, uh, class at certain point in history, okay? And those constant changing uh, uh, political realities have resulted in the fact that you have Uzbeks in Kandahar. A lot of people don't know that, but city center of Kandahar had a hi Uzbek history. There were many Tajiks in Paktika. 
A lot of Pashtuns who now identify as Pashtun or even part of a particular tribe, if you go back in history, you will find out that those people were not actually Pashtuns. They were Arabs, Tajiks, Turks, but they assimilated to the local culture. And likewise, you have many Tajiks who identify as Tajik, but they are Turks or Pashtuns. So, so our reality is that of people constantly mixing with one another, living alongside different groups for many reasons. And if you look at the geography of Afghanistan, you see different valleys, uh, community settlements of people uh, that have came into existence along a particular route in a particular valley where there is enough water, enough uh, arable, arable land. And as a consequence, you create a community there which consists of different groups. So that's the reality of Afghanistan. That's the reality that you can observe with your own eyes. So what you observe with your own eyes in Afghanistan is that people have different language and different ethnicity, but they live in a particular region. When we talk about partitioning Afghanistan into different nation states, that nation state, what, re what is required is that you have to have a... Uh, idea of what a homogenized ethnicity is let's say you know in in our thumbnail there is a flag of hazaristan so the central uh, regions of afghanistan where we have the ethnic hazaras they say we want to be a separate state the, the, the ethno-nationalist hazaras so basically they need first they need to have a homogenized identity of what it means to be a Hazara. Is it a uh, ethnicity? If it's an ethnicity, how you define a Hazara? Uh, is it genetic? Uh, if it's genetic, then I, w I really have to disappoint a lot of these people because Hazaras are mixed with a lot of other local communities, whether it's Tajiks, Turkmens, and uh, Qizilbash, and whatnot. Is it sectarian? Is it is it basically based on being a Shia? Then there are many Shias outside that region. And there are many Sunnis in the Hazarajat as well. So yeah. you immediately create a problem where basically they're saying we need a separate nation state based on a particular identity. But what is that identity? What are its features? How is it defined? Like if we say we need a nation state based on Afghan national identity, well, unfortunately, the whole notion of uh, Afghan national identity has been deconstructed here today uh, in this podcast, w where we explain that the whole notion of Afghan national identity came into existence as a consequence of decisions made by rulers, ideologues and philosophers. So do you have a national identity of the Tajik in Afghanistan? If yes, where do you draw the boundaries where you separate the Hazara Shiite from the Turkic and the Qizilbash and the, Qizilbash, and the yeah. Turkmen and the Uzbeks in, in Badakhshan and Takhar uh, 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 from, the, from the Tajiks? How are you going to draw a line? Oh, and then they say, no, 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 we are not going to draw a line. We just want to separate from the Pashtuns. Fine, let's separate the country based on Pashtun and non-Pashtun, which means that a province like Ghazni, where you have Tajik, Pashtun, Hazara, and uh, I think there are even Kurds in Ghazni uh, and, and some other uh, ethnic groups as well. So in a city, in a province like Ghazni, who gets Ghazni? The north or the south? Yeah. And are you going to fight a war over the, the uh, Ghazni? Who, who gets Kabul? Who gets Kabul? Yeah. So, so, so in, in order to partition, you need to tell a people who have lived alongside one another for thousands of years, look, 
Now we're going to draw a line here and you are part of that country and you're part of that country. And if you don't agree, then we'll use force against you because creating a nation state, one of the necessities of creating a nation state is to enforcing that will of the state upon everyone else with force. So whenever there are lines drawn, most recently Sudan was partitioned. You have South Sudan and, and Main Sudan. You know how much violence has occurred since the creation of South Sudan. You know yeah. how much infighting is going on in South Sudan between opposing parties. Like even right now, the National Resistance Front, Front in Afghanistan, which is a Tajik ethno-nationalist uh, movement, this particular movement, they are at conflict with one another. Like in, in uh, Tajikistan, where most of their people are based, they have different factions who don't talk with one another. Like some, us, uh, some parts of the NRF, they can't stand Amrullah Saleh. They see him as a traitor because they say Amrullah Saleh was a vice president of the Pashtun nationalist Ashraf Ghani and he yeah. backstabbed uh, his own party, the Jamiat Islami. And the same thing is said about uh, uh, Atama Ahmad Noor. So... Even, even among themselves, they're very divided and they're at conflict with one another. So when they talk about partitioning Afghanistan along ethnic lines, right now when there is no partition uh, happening, they're already in conflict with one another. So who is going to guarantee that once the country is separated into different entities, that these people will have peace with each other? And this is this is why when we talk about uh, uh, ethno nationalism and the the groups that advocate for ethno nationalism and partition, we have to always remind people of very inconvenient facts, such as the fact that they have uh, a very distorted perception of reality, and they want to impose that perception of reality on everyone else preferably by force because do you really think that people in afghanistan are just going to accept that their country is going to be split into different parts so that these particular groups get what they want obviously people will resist and there will be violence so i think you know uh for for us uh it is very important to note that we are dealing with groups of people who are, in my opinion, uh, they are pursuing power and wealth for themselves and not so much for their ethnic group. Yeah, of course. I mean, but that's that's uh, that's ultimately the thing. Like, you know, you mentioned um, Atal Mahmoud Nur. Now, it's very well known that Atal Mahmoud Nur and Dostum don't get along very well tomorrow or the day after when partition happens it will then become a fight of tajiks and uzbeks do you know what i like this is this is essentially how we're covering afghanistan and in fact atama matnur is actually accused of being an undercover suleiman khil from loger so, so, but you see what i'm saying it's uh it's it's totally nonsensical and um it's the usual ethnic card it's like i said uh my pashtun village suffered very heavily from the taliban because some local villagers right were let's say manipulated convinced i don't know what whichever word you want to use some local villages of ours were convinced by masood that the taliban would steal their daughters uh, kidnap their daughters right and suffered collective punishment because of it from their fellow Pashtuns. In fact, my village is a Kakar village. The guy who was leading the, this is one of the ironies of life, Sangha. This is why I always say it's complex, dummy. The guy who led the assault on my area was Mullah Fazil, who's now the deputy defense minister. Do you know which tribe he belongs to, Sangar? Kakar. Do you know where, whose village he attacked? Kakar. 
there we go there we go yeah. it's it's complex to me right so, <laughs> so, so, you know, so this like, is... you know what's funny is that like uh even i tweeted something the other day i said uh my taskera in afghanistan stated as uh milyat tajik okay yeah. so during the communist era they used to make these taskeras and uh when it's i was interesting born, that they use the word miliat and not kaumiat because yes. miliat means nation so miliat, they were big no, on no. so the nation. communists the communists made a distinction the milat yeah. was the nation and miliat was ethnicity so no but the thing they they, they, they distinguished it from kaum because yeah. they wanted it to be like a family of nations Yes. You see, like a nation of nations kind of thing. Yeah. But but a milyat is not Arabic. It, 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 like milla is, is Arabic. Yeah. But milya is, 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 is an invention by Afghans. They invented that, milyat. I see. And uh, they would uh, register a milyat of people in documents mm. so uh, my parents my father worked for the government and my mother were working in the education so both of my parents were very busy and all four of us children we didn't have documents so my grandfather his neighbor was a clerk in the municipality so my father and mother asked my grandfather who is a Pashtun uh, Malik of a village who spoke with a thick Pashto accent when he would speak Dari, they asked him, uh, can you please go get uh, taskeras for our children? He said, sure, my neighbor works for the municipality. He will take care of it. So he took us, uh, you know, he, he, he took uh, every, all the necessary documents and he asked the guy who worked for the municipality, like, these are my grandchildren and they need a taskera. Uh, can you make that for them? Back then it was very rudimentary very primitive so the guy he made the document and he said okay what's the name of the father this what's the name of the mother this okay what's miliat and uh, my grandfather uh, when he was asked that question like what is the ethnicity of your grandchildren so the mother was tajik the father was pashtun and my grandfather he was perplexed at that moment like what the hell why what does this mean what is the ethnicity of your grandchildren yeah. he sa i said I, I don't know why why is why does that even matter so the guy the clerk said well just write tajik and he said yeah just write tajik so in my ta taskera it said tajik while my father is pashtun my grandfather is pashtun and the, the 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 guy who actually asked the clerk to make the document he was a pashtun but he didn't yeah. find any fault in the fact that it was written as tajik because it didn't matter yeah they don't didn't see that as a problem and this is yeah. the reality of 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 afghanistan it is complex People identify as a particular ethnicity, but it is not politicized in a way that people see it. So, so right now, if you say I am a Kakar from Shamali and Fazl uh, Mazlum Yar was a Talib, he was a Kakar and he attacked our village, it doesn't make sense to people. Yeah, it doesn't make sense because people are accustomed to believing things are black and white. That pe yeah. things are very simple. Pe people are surprised that there are Pashtuns in Shamali, but Shamali is actually uh, it's not a homogenous area. You have a lot of uh, Arabs as well. You have um, Sadats and Khwajas. You have Pashtuns. Amongst the Pashtuns, you have Safi. You have my village, the Kakar village. Um, you have um, Uriachil, you have Dawudzi, uh, you have loads of different, uh, you have Akakhil, uh, so, so yeah, you've got loads of, but you know, even hearing that for a lot of people is like, what? It's not like a total sea of Tajiks, just like if you tell them, you know, there are Pashtuns in Pakti, sorry, there are Tajiks in Paktika, they'll be like, what? It's not just a land of uh, yellow turbans, right? So, so yeah, this is the thing. And then on top of that, you tell them, yeah, my my Karkar village got absolutely wrecked by forces under the command of another Karkar who didn't give a damn. 
do you really and this goes back to the same thing with Amir Abdurrahman I said at the beginning this guy didn't give a damn about his tribe being on bad terms with him until he needed them so I think um to wrap up the whole podcast Sangar I think I'm just gonna say it's complex dummy <laughs> it's that's, things that's never basically, black and white. that's basically the message of this whole podcast it's very <laughs> complex Dummy. Don't yeah, it's it's complex, dummy. That that should have been I actually the title of the show. Okay, it's complex, dummy. And sadly, you know, the reality is is that the world that we are living in is very complex. But the people who are trying to influence others for political gain, they will actually try to simplify matters into black and white. Yeah, and 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 that's that that's something that we are fighting against. Murtaza, so I'm going back to the chat now, Sangar. Uh, Murtaza is saying the Tajiks in Paktika were yellow turfids too. Which uh, is my true. Apologies. Which yeah, is which true. is true. Which is true, to be honest. But yeah. All right. Okay, so we this have was... a few super chats. Ah, uh, yes. So we have a super chat from Vlad Vlad. Uh, I met an Afghan whose mom was cousin of Carmel. Uh, Vlad. I have my condolences. Uh, yeah. Uh, Vlad, I have a distant relative who is also related to Carmel. So, yeah. Uh thank you very much Vlad Vlad and always Fahad welcome. Khan has sent 100 and a Norwegian krona. Norwegian krona. Why is it that Afghans till this day are still attracted or stand by the nationalistic leaders of the past and present? Be that Najib or Ghani, knowing well that those leaders had their hands dirty. Well, it's because the political discourse in Afghanistan, rather than maturing over the last uh, 20 years, actually regressed and you know descended just into ape-like chest beating with a fair bit of nostalgia. Uh, those, those. That's the main way in which I can put it. Uh, JZ US one, no, sorry, one dollar ninety nine cents. Still waiting for the Musa Shafiq podcast. We haven't forgotten, my friend. We have not forgotten. Um, and I don't think there's a there's any other. Um, there's Guys, any other... thank you very much for joining us for this show, and thank you all for just the before, super chat. Just before we go. Um, please uh, like the video, share it and whatever, because this has been a rather exhaustive podcast. Uh, and uh, yes, Angad, I think it's been overdue that we've done it. It was requested some months ago. Um, I'm glad that we were able to do it. And uh, yeah, it's, oh, we have another super chat. So it's from A Khan, 10 pounds. Sorry to be a pain. Any idea or point when the education issue for young girls will open up also Anas Haqqani wears a yellow turban yes he does wear a yellow turban it's uh it's worn in Waziristan it's worn in Paktia Paktika Khost uh I believe in some areas of Zabal as well so it's Ghazni, Pak- Lugar, yeah yeah Kabul. It's, it's, uh it's pretty the yellow turban is a pretty big thing uh but I don't have any idea when the uh, education issue will be um so to, to the to a moderator uh, Steve Ferry and HSE thank you very much for your contribution for your support and uh, being part of the team and everyone else in the chat thank you very much for being uh, with us today uh, this was a very long uh, exhaustive exhaustive Afghan I live about ethno-nationalism and uh, we hope to see you guys soon until the next episode take good care of yourself and each other assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa alaikum assalam